All right, hello guys. This is for Contemporary Issues class. Uh, we are ready for CI number 10, Contemporary Issues Standard number 10. And this one is all about global disasters. Uh, so we're gonna go through the 2011 Japanese earthquake, Chernobyl, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which are the atomic bombs, uh, the Great Chicago Fire. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about world epidemics, which I'm sure you are just more than happy to hear about that last one because we've been going through it so much. Let me close this door real quick. Sorry about that, didn't want any interruptions. Um, so here we go, we're gonna go ahead and get started. The first one we gotta talk about is the 2011 Japanese earthquake. Uh, remember to pause as needed and uh, you can pause and we'll work on the questions together. Remember, email me with any questions. Y'all been doing a really great job with all this stuff. I know some of this stuff seems a little bit random that we have to learn, but um, it's at least, I think, pretty interesting. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump in with the 2011 Japanese earthquake. All right, so here's what happened on March 11th, uh, 20, 2011, excuse me, 2011, uh, there was an earthquake, and it was actually way out here in the ocean off the coast of Japan, off the east coast, okay? And um, it is the fourth strongest earthquake in recorded history. Now, there may have been some long time ago that were stronger than this one, but in recorded history, this is the fourth strongest ever, and for Japanese history, it is the first strongest ever. So it's, it's often called the Great East Japan Earthquake because it is the strongest in Japanese history, at least that's recorded. Now, it was 18 miles under the ocean, so underground under the ocean, 18 miles deep. But here's the problem with it, is when it, when it happened, uh, it caused a big tsunami. So not only does the earthquake shake Japan and cause a lot of problems, but uh, it also causes a big tsunami that washes over the east coast of Japan and causes a whole, whole lot of problems. Um, so here's a map here of the shaking of, uh, from the earthquake, and you can see along the east coast is very, very strong. Um, Fukushima is a place where there was a big problem because they had a nuclear reactor there and when all this happened it lost power and when it lost power it got really hot and it melted down and basically exploded and caused a lot of radiation poisoning. Um, but uh, So perceived shaking was very strong in this eastern region. In the central region it was less strong and then over here they could still feel it but not, as quite, not quite as bad. Um, but this side is definitely strong, very badly affected by the earthquake um, and we're going to see some pictures of disasters. So, the Great East Japan Earthquake, or the 2011 Japanese Earthquake. So there it is. Now, like I said before, the main problem that happened with it was a tsunami, okay? So this tsunami, it was a wave, and what a tsunami is, basically a tidal wave, a giant wave. Um, the wave traveled at 435 miles per hour. It's crazy, that's so fast. It's like faster than any car. It's like as fast as an airplane, basically. It's a huge, giant wave, 133 feet tall, so, we're on the second floor here. I bet this building is probably like 35, 40 feet tall. So you can imagine it's almost four times bigger than this. Um, so 30, uh, excuse me, 435 miles an hour, 133 feet tall, big wave coming at you. You can't even imagine the fear and the terror. And this caused major, major destruction. Um, this stuff is interesting to learn about, but I almost hate learning about it because it is so bad in world history that this happened. Um, because a lot of people lost their lives. About 15,900 people were killed. Um, so this is really, really bad. All right, so let's just keep going. Um, so you can see more pictures here and you can just see that giant wall of water coming in. Uh, what I wanted to focus on here though is uh, the, the amount of the, really the, uh, the casualty cost of this is, so notice 15,899, we'll call it 15,900 deaths, over 6,000 injured, 2,500 people missing. And if you notice right here, 228,000 people um, basically had to move. Like they just couldn't live here anymore or either they don't want to move back, or if they live in the area of Fukushima where that nuclear reactor is, they can't move back because it's too dangerous because of that uh, radiation poison that's in the area. So this is like a really tough topic to talk about because it is super sad. I mean, this is a huge amount of death and injuries and casualties overall. So this is a very tough situation. Um, and you can see just how big that wall of water is in comparison like to the cars you can see coming in. Um, I can just imagine, you know, this is absolutely terrifying, so. So a big earthquake happens in the middle of the ocean off the coast, causes huge tidal wave, and the tidal wave, the tsunami, is really what caused the major amount of damage, okay? So here again, you can see some more damage. Um, this was so bad in Japan, if you notice what it says, uh, 699,000 buildings damaged, 121,000 totally, completely destroyed, 280,000 half destroyed. 
Um, but it takes out a lot of electricity. About 4.4 million households were left without electricity and noticed 1.5 million households without water. So that's one of the scariest things is like, you know, something like this happens and if you're not initially killed or not initially, you know, very badly injured or something, you're still gonna have to deal with a very hard time after that because maybe your house is destroyed. Maybe you don't have running water for the long period of time and you have to leave. You basically become a refugee. So super tough situation, um, real, real bad. Um, the Prime Minister of Japan at the time, he said this is the toughest and most difficult thing since World War II. He compared it really to the atomic bombings um, because in a lot of ways, I mean, if you look at this, I mean, it's just utter destruction. So really bad, um, yeah, tough situation. Similar, similar to World War II for sure. All right, now, here's the other bad part. So when this tsunami and this earthquake happened, um, Fukushima is a city in Japan and they had nuclear reactors there. And so the cities there, they run off nuclear power. Nuclear power is really good in that it's clean and that it's renewable and it's constantly, you know, it's a very good source of electricity. However, it's also, it can be really dangerous if, it's, if it gets out of control. So here's what happened. These nuclear reactors, they lost power and they have to have power in order to stay cool and they have that water that runs through and keeps it cool. Well, they lost power because of the earthquake and because of the tsunami. And so the inside of the nuclear reactor got really, really hot and it got so hot that it exploded. And I think I have another picture, right? All right, hang on, I'll show you one more. Yep, still much more. So there's the actual explosion. Um, so anyway, when this exploded, it was a really bad thing because it releases all of this radiation in the air and radiation is poison. Um, and so the whole area had to be evacuated, which a lot of people had already left anyway because of the tsunami and the earthquake and everything. But then they can't come back because the area around it, the sky, the land, it's all contaminated because that um, radiation goes up into the air and falls down as uh, radioactive rain, or uh, I believe it's called black rain, so yeah. So just one thing after another, you got earthquake, you got a tsunami, and then as a result, you get this nuclear power plant which explodes and uh, causes a whole lot of problems in that area. Radiation, real bad thing, okay? Now, uh, the cost of this whole disaster, which I know you shouldn't go from talking about human lives being lost to talking about money, it seems insensitive. Uh, unfortunately, in history, that's kind of how it goes, though. Um, so, in cost, it costs uh, 235 billion US dollars, uh, which is the most expensive natural disaster in history, at least up until that point. There may be one now that has cost more, uh, but at that point, it was the costliest natural disaster in history, 235 billion dollars. And you can see, it's crazy to see like a boat, but you gotta think, this thing was probably out in the middle of the ocean, that big tidal wave brought it in. So, crazy, crazy, crazy. All right, 235 billion dollars. All right, so again, this is made, I mean, it's just a major, major uh, emergency, human refugee crisis, like we said before, 15,900 deaths, 300,000 refugees. That means people who are just homeless, they don't have a place to go. Um, they don't have water, they don't have food, they don't have medicine. If you think about that, you've got your house sitting over here, big tidal wave comes and washes it away, and you need heart medicine, or you need kidney medicine, dialysis, something like that all of a sudden you don't have access to that anymore and then you're in really bad shape, okay? So just overall, just a really bad situation, a natural disaster. It's one of the scariest things because you know it's completely out of your control um, and it's not man-made, just a real big problem. And then of course the Fukushima uh, Daiichi nuclear power plant explosion, which then you know contaminates the whole area. People still can't move back there, so it's real, real bad. So just very tough situation. Okay, so let's write these. Remember to pause if you need to, email me if you need to, and uh, if you keep up, hopefully it'll go good. Right. So number one, how does the 2011 Japanese earthquake rank in Japan's history? For Japan, it is the first, AKA the strongest, okay? And in world history, it is fourth, fourth strongest. Now, like I said, this is in recorded history. So before they started keeping up with this information, there may have been some that were stronger. And in fact, there probably were some that were stronger. Number two, what natural disaster was triggered by the earthquake? This is a tsunami, which is a tidal wave, it's a gigantic wave. Um, it was 133 feet tall. So if you think of a building, a story of a building is about 10, it's about 10 feet. So the ceiling right here is about 10 feet above me. So it would be a 13 story thing. And this school building is only two stories. Well, really it's three. 
So yeah, you can imagine. Woo! And how fast is it moving? 435 miles per hour. If I'm not mistaken, I think an airplane flies around 500 miles per hour. So this is a serious, serious, and scary. I mean, think about how scary that is. So anyway. All right, so explain the following statistics from the tsunami. How many dead? I believe our number was 15,900. So crazy. Missing 2,500, 2,500. And uh, how many were forced to relocate? I think the number was like 228,000. And then we saw another number that was 300,000. So there's never a way to be 100% sure. Let's call it 250,000 just to kind of keep it in the ballpark range there. This is a whole lot of people. So first of all, this is a lot of people dying. That's terrible, that's a huge number. Uh, 2,500 missing, so likely maybe dead. We don't know, that's sad. And then 250,000 homeless after that. So this is a major, major, major crisis. This is a huge deal here. All right, now, uh, what did the Japanese Prime Minister compare the earthquake slash tsunami disaster of 2011 to? He, he claimed it was a lot like World War II, so I'm gonna put WW2. And also I'm gonna put uh, the atomic bombings. Because if you think about this, I mean, it really is. Because you get the complete destruction from the earthquake and the tsunami, which kills this many people. The atomic bombings, of course, they cause complete dest destruction. Then you gotta think about the whole Fukushima uh, nuclear plant thing, calling, creating all that radiation. So then the atomic bombs, same deal. So this is crazy. It's sad. All right, if you need them, pause them. And let's rock and roll. All right, number five, what unexpected disaster occurred because of the lack of power to Fukushima's nuclear reactors? Uh, they exploded. And, oh, exposed. Exploded, not exposed. They exploded and melted down. That's what you call it when uh, they catch on fire like that and all that radiation escapes, it's called a meltdown, nuclear meltdown. What was the estimated economic cost of the 2011 earthquake slash tsunami? Uh, it was US $235 billion, $235 billion, which is a whole lot of money. And then what types of shortages occurred? And this is what's, to me, if, you, if it doesn't initially kill you, it doesn't initially injure you really bad, this is what's scary is you're gonna have no electricity, obviously, but no water, no food, no medicine. If all your stuff is gone, you're homeless and that's it, okay? So, um, so what types of shortages? Food, water, medicine, housing, etc. And to me, this is one of the scariest things because, I mean, these people, it's not in the middle of a war. It's just a normal day, everything's going fine. And all of a sudden, the continental plates shift, earthquake, big tsunami. I mean, you're just living your normal life and then all of a sudden, literally, everything's ripped away from you or you could even be killed and you didn't even know what happened. So that's what's so scary about it, so yeah. All right, so there's world disaster number one. I actually do feel a little bit depressed now after talking about that, uh, it's pretty sad, um, but that's it. So 2011 Japanese earthquake. I'm not going to say anything else about it. Let's rock and roll. We're going to move on. I believe the next one is Chernobyl. So Chernobyl actually is kind of similar to this 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. Because what Chernobyl was, it was a nuclear power plant which was in Ukraine, okay? And uh, it, was, it melted down. What they tried to do is they tried to have a, um, they tried to test to see if they were ready for an accident. They were like, hey, let's run a test and see if we lose power, how are we gonna respond and what's gonna happen? So they actually, I don't wanna say the workers caused this, but they kind of did. So what they were trying to do, they were trying to test and see like, hey, if an emergency happens where we lose power, how are we gonna respond? So they actually shut off the power to this nuclear power plant at Chernobyl in Ukraine and they couldn't get the power to come back on. And so the power stayed off for, I think it was only like 10 minutes. And these nuclear reactors got so hot that they eventually caught fire, exploded and melted down. Now, 
This is, it's called the worst nuclear disaster in history, and it's rated at a seven. Um, and a seven apparently is the highest number. So there's all these scales, like the Richter scale, the, the earthquake, I believe was at a nine. And then, so you got like that. And you know you have like a tornado scale where you have like an F5, it's like a really bad tornado. Well, there's a nuclear scale and a seven is the top scale and uh, Chernobyl hits the top. So it's considered the, one of the worst. So it melted down, you can see it exploded, you can see right there the damage. Um, remember, you can download this off my website, there's a better image of it, okay? So what happened was, like I said, they wanted to, they just tried to test it. They're like, hey, we need to, and it's a good idea, you should always run through your emergency protocols, you know, have a drill, something, something sort of like that, so you see if you're ready, so you can be prepared. Well, the problem was it got out of hand. Uh, they weren't prepared and things got weird, and this thing exploded and melted down and uh, everybody in the town had to leave um, and things got real weird because of all the radiation so um, yeah so there's the, like what actually went down i'm not going to read it to you but just know they tried to test these things and try to test their emergency plan and uh basically it failed so yeah so um the operators they had an unstable reactor due to the lack of power it was unable to cool down it overheated and boom it exploded and then it melted down um, and then when it, went, when it melted down, all this radiation is released out into the atmosphere. Uh, notice it went all the way up to about 16 kilometers away. So I think that's what, uh, like 12 miles-ish, roughly, 10 or 11, 12 miles. Um, about 49,000 people had to leave. And the problem is that all the emergency workers that went in there, um, a lot of them got really sick. Um, well, some of them died immediately from burns and things like that. Um, but a lot of them developed cancer and things like that. So it ends up being a lot of people get evacuated. Um, real, real bad. Yeah, real, real bad. So radiation is a real bad thing. And I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, so notice uh, 134 emergency responders came, like firefighters and things. Uh, 28 people died shortly after. Um, and cancer, about 14 cases of the 134 over the next 10 years. Now, the radiation stayed in the area, it got down in the earth, in the ground, and when it gets in the ground, it gets in the ground water, and that water eventually gets consumed by humans in either plant or liquid form. So this is a major, major issue. Um, I'm going to show you a picture, I think it's on the next slide, it's kind of disturbing, this stuff, this radiation that gets out into the world because of this nuclear reactor messing up, uh, radiation causes birth defects, causes cancer, and it causes birth defects. So. I'm gonna show you a picture. I think it's on the next slide. Yep, there you go. Um, so this is, I mean, this is one of the saddest things right here is because, you know, these people, they have nothing to do with Chernobyl except that they just lived in the area. Um, and because of this radiation that escaped, because of this poor planning, because of this disaster, which really was happened because of people failing, um, you get a lot of bad stuff that happens, such as birth defects. Also notice they anticipate a whole lot more cancer deaths going up. Um, if you see the numbers there, about 16,000 fatalities. This is in the future. This is what's coming because of this. So people growing up nearby the area where they're like still being exposed to radiation, they don't even, maybe don't even realize it. And they grow up and they have all these problems and then eventually develop cancer. And unfortunately that probably will lead to their deaths. Um, just, yeah, so this is a heavy topic, man. Um, real sad, radiation, nuclear stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a major thing, major, major thing, okay? Um, so what they've done to try to fix it all is they've built something called a sarcophagus. And what it is, I think I have a picture. Yeah, this is it. It's basically they put a giant tomb around it, and I'll go back to the picture in a second, um, to try to keep in the radiation and the debris. Because the thing about that um, plant is, and let me go back a couple of slides, when it melts it down, when it's still hot, it's still releasing radiation. So it's just constant release of radiation. So like anytime the wind blows, it's gonna carry radiation off. Um, anytime, you know, just it's, if it's hot or anything, that radiation is gonna get out into the air. And it's real, real bad and it just gets carried around and it gets all over uh, Russia, Soviet Union, Europe, um, Eastern Europe, all around that area. So it's really, really bad. And the problem is it's expensive to try to deal with it. So you see this giant thing that they've built. This is very, very expensive. This thing is huge. Um, so it's very, very expensive. It takes a really long time. When the people go in to work on it, they have to wear these big full suits. So it's just like a big ordeal. 
So you go back to that question of is nuclear power really worth it? And in this case, I would definitely say probably not. Um, so it's going to take uh, up until 2065 to get it done, to get the whole thing covered up and clean or safe or whatever. I mean, 2065, that's still 45 years away. And this happened in uh, 1982, I believe, uh, early 80s or mid 80s. So crazy, crazy, crazy. And look, it cost US $68 billion to fix. So this is just real bad situation. To me, this is worse than the Japanese earthquake because they could have not done this. So, <clears throat> so let me look at this. Let's make sure we can still see okay. Make sure it's looking good. And we're doing good on time, only 20 minutes in, that's good. What was the rank of the Chernobyl disaster, disaster on the international nuclear event scale? Um, worst nuclear disaster in history. Oof. Worst nuclear disaster in history. All right. Why did the Chernobyl disaster happen? Was it completely accidental? So the Japanese post-tsunami nuclear meltdown, that was totally accidental, right? That's totally out of their control. Chernobyl though, I told you, the workers were testing their uh, emergency response and it failed. So um, let's just say that um, workers failed to turn on emergency electricity. Now, I'm not blaming the workers at all. Please don't think that. I'm not blaming the workers. However, it seemed like they would have had a backup plan for a backup plan when you're dealing with this. And from what I can tell, there was no backup plan to the backup plan. Workers failed on to turn on emergency power and the reactor overheated. When it overheated, it exploded. When it exploded, Big, big problems. Uh, how were emergency responders affected by the Chernobyl meltdown? There were burns, deaths, that's a D, deaths, and cancer. Real bad. Real, real bad. Make sure you go ahead and write that. Let me see how my answers look. They're legible. All right, pause it if you need it. Email me if you need to. Answer these. How many fatalities are expected in the future? Now, this is the future because of the cancer that's going to develop because of that radiation that's in the ground and in the water. Uh, I believe the number was 16,000. It was somewhere in the range of 9,000 to 16,000. We're going to put 16. When is Chernobyl's nuclear cleanup scheduled for completion? I told you it's going to be about 45 years from now, so 2065. So crazy, it's almost 100 years it's taken for this to happen because it happened in the 1980s, so 80 years, so crazy. And then how much is the estimated US dollar cost? I believe it was $68 billion. Woo! It's like, it's, why did they do, you know, that's the question, it's like, if we could go back. But, you know, there's a lot of things in life that you say, well, if we could go back, we probably would have done it differently. In fact, Probably most things, or a lot of stuff in history, we'd say if we could go back and do it differently, we would. Absolutely. All right, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which hopefully you learned about in U.S. history class, and I know most of you are seniors, so you probably took that last year. Um, so, of course, we know these two cities in Japan. Uh, they were the places where the atomic bomb was used. The only time the atomic bomb has been used during war. There have been nuclear tests as far as nuclear bombs being dropped. However, uh, during warfare, there have only been these two examples. Uh, the bombings killed about, we're going to call it 225,000 people. I like to keep it on the high end because if you keep it on the low end, then you can justify it again, and that's not good. So here's the deal. Um, during World War II, America is fighting Japan, um, and this is after European victory was already achieved. So now America is focusing solely on fighting Japan. And when they looked at the war in the Pacific versus Japan, they realized if the war continues on the same trajectory that it was already on, over 1 million American troops would be sent to Japan and probably killed, captured, or wounded, okay? So they were looking at about a million casualties, a million American casualties. And the whole time America had been working on the strongest, most powerful weapon ever, the atomic bomb. Uh, and so what they decided to do, they said, hey, Japan, we have something bigger, badder, worse than you've ever seen, 
and we're willing to use it, but if you are willing to surrender, then we won't use it. Well, Japan thinks that they're just bluffing. They're like, nah, nah, we're gonna keep fighting this war. And notice what it even says. The United States and England said, we will give you prompt and utter destruction. And that's actually pretty much what happened. And Japan's like, nah, we don't believe you. We don't know you. We don't think you have this stuff. We don't believe you. And so the United States says, okay. Um, the two bombs, they are called uh, Fat Man and Little Boy. This one's Fat Man, this one's Little Boy. You can see why it's more round and then Little Boy is a little bit smaller. Um, but these are two uh, atomic bombs, they're nuclear weapons. Um, they work through fission, which I believe is when you split apart an atom, not uh, fusion is when you put it together, it's fission is splitting it apart. So at the end of July, they tell Japan like, hey, end the war now and we won't, you know, you're gonna be okay. They said no, and on August 6th, the first one was dropped. Uh, it was a little boy bomb, and then three days later, they dropped a fat man. So the first one was on Hiroshima. Uh, they had military headquarters there, but the main targets here are gonna end up being civilians. Yeah, so yikes. Um, and I mean, it's just instant death for the people that are surrounded. So like literally, you can see the town here, this is a good picture. Well, not a good picture, but it's a picture that shows well the damage. So, I mean, full town, full on city here. This is before the bomb was dropped, and then after the bomb was dropped, literally nothing left. Um, the bomb was so strong that anyone that was around was just like vaporized, and the flash from it was so bright that um, it was like a, like a camera basically, and like say my shadow is on the wall behind me, if the bomb hit around me, my body would be completely vaporized and it would capture the shadow on the wall. And you can look up pictures of this on the internet, um, just how crazy this weapon is. So, real, real bad situation, um, not good. And it totally changes world history because after that you're in the Cold War where everybody's constantly worried of who's gonna drop the next one, okay? Now, uh, the strategy for the United States works uh, because after this, after the two bombs are dropped, Japan's like, okay, please don't drop any more. This is enough. Obviously, you're the winner. Uh, but like I said, this, this creates a huge debate. Is it ethical to have the world's strongest weapon? Is it okay to have the world's strongest weapon? And is it okay to use the world's strongest weapon? Um, and of course, other countries now have nuclear weapons, and that's what's really scary is because we're not the only one. And I don't want to sound like, oh, America is the only one, it should be the only one, but it's scary when you think about other countries possibly doing it to us. And I think that's kind of the fear that a lot of people have. It's like, well, we need them because somebody else has them. So, real scary, um, real tough, but it's history. So, there it is. All right, how many people were killed by the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I believe we put the number at 225,000 or right around there. Okay. What were the names of the atomic bombs dropped on Japan? There were Fat Man and Little Boy. Fat Man was the big one, Little Boy was the other one. Okay. What well, warning was Japan was given to Japan on July 26th? They said surrender. Or face destruction. Pretty much what they said. Email. For months after the bombings, what caused people to die in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? It's radiation poisoning, radiation poisoning. So this can come in the form of burns. So radiation causes burns. Um, also just the initial bombings burned a lot of people. Um, when radiation, like I told you earlier, gets up into the atmosphere, it causes acid rain, like severely acidic poisonous rain. I believe it's called black rain. Um, and so that gets in the water, people drink it, people get really sick. And it basically, this is graphic, but it basically rots your guts from the inside out. So people would be throwing up blood, people's organs would literally be just melting inside of them. Um, just real, real bad stuff, real bad stuff. Your hair falls out, just real, real bad. You cry blood, things like that. Ugh. Um, and how did the bombings affect the tide of the war? Uh, Japan surrendered shortly after.
you go. Let me take a look. See how we're doing on time too. 29 minutes, rocking and rolling. It's pretty good. And we're gonna go quick down because the, the rest of them are a little less heavy. So that's good. All right, the Great Chicago Fire. Um, this happened in 1871. Um, compared to the others, it's a little less heavy because it only killed 300 people. Now, I know that sounds bad saying it only killed 300 people, but it's not like the tsunami. It's not like the uh, atomic bombs. It's not as heavy and long lasting as uh, Chernobyl. But I mean, this still was really, really bad. So in 1871, they had had a long, hot, dry, windy fall and summer and fall. Um, and somehow this fire got started. No one actually knows how the fire got started. There's a lot of legends about how it got started. Um, including one saying a cow kicked over a lantern in a barn and a lantern caught the hay in the barn on fire. Then the barn caught the buildings around it on fire and boom, wind took the fire and burned down a huge area of Chicago, 3.3 square miles. So from Rockvale to roughly uh, Publix on 99. So big, big area, this is a huge fire, okay? Now, what is scary about this is that it left 90,000 people homeless. 90,000 people were homeless because of this fire. So you think one day you're chilling, you know, doing your thing, living your life, enjoying life, and then all of a sudden just some random fire happens because of a cow. We don't, that's actually, I don't think it's actually true. It's just a legend. And I looked it up actually and it says it's probably very likely to be not true. Uh, but anyway, uh, so they had this fire and then 90,000 people homeless. So you're just living your life and then some random fire and you're homeless. So this is what's scary. Um, and I think what is kind of the point of us learning this is like, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So again, great Chicago fire, 300 people killed, 90,000 homeless. Um, a lot of people helped out with this um, once it was over. So it's actually, I don't want to say it was a good thing. It's definitely not a good thing, but what happened is it modernized Chicago. So before this, Chicago had a lot of wooden buildings, kind of old school way of life. I mean, you can see it's like dirt roads, go back. It's like dirt roads, you got horse-drawn carriages and stuff. And after this, they see this as an opportunity. So after this, it also creates a debate. People were saying, hey, this happened because cities shouldn't be this big. This happened because not that many people should live close to each other. This happened because, and you know, remember how American history used to be, because you are not following God or something like that, it's punishment or anything. That's the old view, you know. Um, but, so they creates this debate of, maybe we need to go back to being more old fashioned. Maybe we need to go back to the country. Maybe we need to go spread out again. But then other people saw it as, hey, we can make some money, we can rebuild, we can make Chicago into the greatest city ever because now it's been destroyed and we can literally rebuild from the ground up. And I think that's kind of what happened um, as far as history goes, is now Chicago's a massive city. Um, they did rebuild and obviously a lot of people still do live there. So that's the Great Chicago Fire. Not much you gotta know about that one. Uh, 300 people were killed, 90,000 homeless. Big deal, uh, and it creates this debate of like, should we be more old school or should we be more new school? And I think that's kind of been the whole kind of running topic through all of this is these natural disasters, these things that happen, these disasters, man-made or natural. Is it because of man? Is it because of nature? Is it a mixture of both? And it is a mixture of both on all of these so far. So, uh, so number 19. How much of Chicago was destroyed by the Great Fire? That was 3.3 square miles. 3.3 square miles. Which is roughly the area from here at Rockvale, basically all the way up to the grocery store. It's a long way. How many Chicagoans, Chicagoans were left homeless by the blaze? 90,000. That's a lot. Yeah. All right, how did the Chicago city government change course after the Great Fire? They changed the way they built buildings, yeah. Uh, changed the building codes, made it safer. So that actually is good. That's something that came out of it. They made buildings um, where, you know, you gotta have a fire escape, you gotta have a way to get out, things like that. So, so we'll put safer over here. Um, what two arguments arose? Well, so should we have an old school way of living? And just fundamentally, it goes back to that, hey, we need to be living out in the country, we need to be going to church, we need to be family oriented, this big city life is not the way to go, that sort of thinking. So old school way of life, which is rural by nature, rural meaning countryside, versus new school, fast paced, and then the 
opposite of rural is urban. So city. So it's just this old, I mean, and uh, living in Tennessee, I'm sure y'all have encountered this before with your grandparents or old people where they say, oh, I remember how things used to be. It used to be so much better. And it's because it was smaller, less crowded, um, less outside influence or whatever, you know what I'm saying. Um, and then you have kind of the more new school fast pace. And neither one of them is wrong. Neither one of them is inherently wrong at all. Um, it, but this is the debate that emerged, okay? All right, pause it if you need it. And I think we're about on our last one. Last one. All right, this is the one I don't really want to talk about because I'm sure y'all are sick of hearing about coronavirus and things like that. And these standards actually came out before coronavirus. So they don't have much to do with coronavirus, but we do need to talk about world epidemics. And this, again, it goes back to that idea of, is it nature or is it man? Whose fault is it? Is it nature's fault? Is it man's fault? Why do bad things keep happening? That sort of thing. Um, and here's the problem. As people get better at moving around due to planes, due to we're communicating better through internet, so we're more willing to travel, we have a global economy now. So we are not just a local world anymore. We're a global world. We are a global community. Since we are a global community, that means we share everything, including viruses and sickness and disease, okay? And the earliest evidence of this would have been the Spanish flu, which happened in 1918. It started in 1918. Um, it killed about 50 to 100 million people. Uh, now, I don't know what the current number of coronavirus deaths is, but I don't think it's even even very close to that number at all. Um, those of you that know me know I've stopped keeping up with coronavirus just because I don't need that negativity in my life. But I do know in history the Spanish flu killed 50 to 100 million people. And as far as I know, that number is way higher than what the current coronavirus deaths are. I'll look it up later so that way I'm informed. Please don't think I'm not informed, those of you at home. I know what's going on in the world. I just choose to think about the positive parts of life. It helps me get through the day. So get mad at me if you want to. Sorry. Now, don't get mad at me, please. <laughs> if you got any questions, send me an email. But anyways, so um, viruses, y'all know how viruses spread. When patient zero, so they have symptoms and may not even know it. They infect two people, then these two people go infect two people. And you can see how quickly it does spread. And with our global economy now, when you've got people traveling all the time, all around the world, like on airplanes, on boats, if you've got people going all around the world, you got to think somebody leaves New York City. Uh, they go through an airport. They don't even realize they're sick. They accidentally get two people sick. Those two people, let's say this whole plane, they fly to London, England. Those people get off that plane, how many people do they infect in London? Let's say you got an airplane full of, what, 200 people? That easily is a logical number for an airplane. So 200 people, they're all sick because of one guy, uh, and then they all infect you know, two people each after that, and soon you've got a big, big thing that gets out of hand, okay? And the question goes back to, is it man, is it nature, what's the deal? Now here's the problem though, and it goes back to this man versus nature thing. Man has a responsibility to try to fix these viruses. That's our goal, is always to try to come up with a vaccine or a medicine. And here's the problem. Nature really is pretty much as smart as we are. I mean, we're a part of nature and nature is always constantly changing, adapting and evolving, okay? And viruses, as we've seen with the whole COVID thing, they change, they adapt, they evolve. They get stronger, they get bigger, they move around quickly, that sort of thing. They're spread quickly. And the problem is with a vaccine or medicine is it takes a long time. You have to figure out what works, what doesn't work. You have to run tests on it to make sure it's safe. So it's this whole idea of, are we ever gonna be not vulnerable? Are we ever gonna be above nature? And I think if you just look at all those historical events, the fire, Chernobyl, the atomic bombs, the earthquake, the earthquake itself really shows us a lot, the tsunami, I don't think we're ever going to be more powerful than nature, but vaccines are a way that we keep trying. So I think that's the theme that goes throughout this thing. Um, so you can see all the current things. Yeah, there we go. So here's the fatality rate, so deaths. Um, this is as of November 2019, so this is quite behind. So this is not current at all, um, but it's the best one I could find as far as comparing the things. Um, if y'all remember Ebola, Ebola was really scary for a minute there. It's got a very high mortality rate. 
Um, a lot of these others are probably more localized to smaller places. Um, H1N1, I believe that one was the swine flu, or yeah, I think that's what it was. Um, so yeah, so you can see quite a, quite a big deal there, okay? All right, now I like this picture because yeah, swine flu, H1N1. Um, so this is from the Spanish flu, which was 1918 to 1920, so right at 100 years ago. And notice, I know a lot of us um, here at school and just in general are not huge fans of the masks, but masks have been around as a thing for quite some time. Um, I actually didn't even know, I saw this picture the other day and I was like, oh wow, I didn't even realize that that was a thing back then. Um, so yeah, so you can see them there, police in their masks. Um, I knew that they did the social distancing thing back in the day, that was nothing new. So, But yeah, so it's crazy, you know, we, we're, we're getting smarter as people, but nature keeps getting smarter with us too. Um, still figuring out ways to take us down. Um, so here's the thing, we have to look at the economy and the globalization and just the whole thing and we have to say, is it worth it? Is it worth it to have global trade and is it worth it to be this interconnected? Is it worth it to, for us to be a global community if these things are going to keep happening? Um, I think overall the answer is yes. I think economically it makes sense for us to trade with other countries because we get good deals that way. Um, it's good for the other countries, it's good for us. And as long as people are peaceful, the global economy is a good thing. And unfortunately, like we were talking about a minute ago, nature just has a way of always throwing a wrench in the gears um, and doing these things with diseases, vaccines, and of course, natural disasters too. Okay? So um, I believe that's it on this lesson. Uh, there's some questions, there's some airline statistics, things like that. I get sick of talking about and hearing about the COVID stuff, so I don't wanna wear it out. Um, but yeah, so this whole big lesson has been very interesting because it's like where, who's more powerful, nature or man? And I think nature continues to win every time. Um, even like with the atomic bomb, I know it's man-made, but using the atom is a natural thing. It's a natural phenomenon. So um, very, very interesting, very interesting lesson, I think. So what is called the transcontinental, what has caused the transcontinental movement of infectious diseases? Globalization and a global economy. So globalization just means we are very interconnected. So I could get on the internet right now and hit up somebody in China and have a full conversation just because of the internet. So globalization means we're a global community. Globalization and a global economy. So that means most of the countries in the world are trading with each other, or a good portion of them are at least. And when you have this interaction between people who have never interacted before, of course, things are gonna happen. How deadly was the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic? Now, just like then, or just like now, back then, um, and I'm not making any comments on the media or anything, but numbers, there was always a disparity in the numbers between actual cases, perceived cases, actual deaths, perceived deaths, that sort of thing. So the number varies. It's somewhere between 50 to 100 million. And again, I'm not trying to be weird talking about this COVID stuff. I'm not trying to be political in any way. I know it's real. I know it's very scary. I know it's deadly. I know people who have been affected by it. And it is scary. Um, but, you know, there's become this weird political side to it. And it's just such a strange time. Uh, but anyways, why are viruses or diseases slash viruses difficult to treat or find a vaccine for? Um, number one, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. And the viruses adapt slash evolve. They're changing, they change too. So they get stronger, they get bigger, they change overall, just that sort of thing. How is economic globalization both a good thing and a bad thing? Um, global trade equals money. And more money goes around, the better. And peace. because And I know that seems like, well, peace? There ain't no peace. There actually is. When the, uh, global economies emerge, um, countries are more willing to talk to each other because money, money is a big thing. It's a big motivator. People don't want to lose access to that money. So a big reason why we haven't gone to war with China over the years, even though we're uh, ideologically very different than China, is because of money. We both have a good relationship uh, with each other's money. Um, so it works. So money is a good motivator. Uh, how is it a bad thing? And uh, it's this right here, pandemics, epidemics and pandemics. So these diseases, these things, these bad things that spread. Okay, so 
there we have it. So um, I believe that's the end of the lesson. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Um, I'm sorry it was pretty heavy. I honestly did get, I didn't think I would get feeling the way I felt talking about Japan. That's so sad. Um, and it just takes it back to all of these topics have something to do with the power of nature. Even the atomic bomb stuff and the nuclear reactor stuff, that is nature. Those things occur naturally and man has figured out how to harness it but we're not that good at it yet. Like with the, with the meltdowns, the nuclear meltdowns, it's causing cancer and all that stuff. So we're figuring out how to deal with nature. And again, with the viruses and everything, we're figuring out how to be better than that. But at the same time, we're really not. And we're struggling with that still. Um, and then things like fire and tsunamis and earthquakes, just things that, you know, man, we build ourselves up, you know, oh, we, uh, we control fire. Oh, we're the strongest species because we got thumbs and we're really good at stuff and we make technology. But then, you know, things come back and bite us. So, um, yeah, so that was a cool lesson. Uh, depressing, but cool nonetheless. Uh, hopefully you got something out of it. And uh, if you need any help on the assignment, email me. Uh, I apologize for being a little bit late with the video. The weather was really nice this weekend, and I wanted to hang out with my wife and my kids. So don't be too mad at me. Um, but here's the video, and here's all the answers to the stuff. So, um, anyways, hope you learned something. Hope it was great. Hope you're having a good day. And holler if you need me. Bye.